Good evening and welcome to Kini News. So the issue of high costs of goods seems to be unresolved with many people complaining over the prices that keep rising. Well, it's the season of giving, isn't it? So a Perak Assembly person today decided he was going to bring a little gift to the State Assembly to get his point across. Kulukinta Assembly Person Muhammad Arafat Varisai Muhammad has had enough of the recent price hikes that he decided to pay a visit to the constituency of Gunung Semanggol to buy a present for his fellow Assembly Person. Saya bawa satu hadiah kepada hadiah kepada Gunung Semanggol sebab ni special ni sebab Resit ni, ayam ni daripada Gunung Semanggol. Kita belikan situ. Berat no. Mana ya? Ah, eh. Ah, ni. Tak apa, tak apa. Demi kepentingan rakyat. Mana ya? Dalam resit ni, untuk makluman Dewan dan apa ketua, uh, Dato' Speaker, sebelum tujuh hari bulan, harga ayam di Gunung Semanggol sendiri dah mencecah RM10 lebih kilo. Maknanya, lepas tujuh hari bulan ni, saya dia fahamkan, keluar satu skim harga maksimal keluarga Malaysia, kata. Oleh Kementerian Perdagangan dan Negeri. RM9.30. Maknanya, apa yang berlaku di kawasan Gunung Semanggur sendiri, sangat menyusahkan rakyat. Muhammad Arafat's qualm was that there was no concrete plan to resolve the issue. He said the Kluaga Malaysia Maximum Price Control Scheme did nothing to bring down the price of raw chicken. The scheme was a government effort to stabilize the prices and supplies of essential goods in the market. His qualms were directed at Plantations, Agriculture and Food Industry Committee Chairperson Razman Zakaria, who is also the Gunung Semanggol State Assembly Person. This matter was also brought up in the Dewan Rakyat, with a lawmaker questioning how Ismail Sabri Yaakob's cabinet could score 90% in their report card when it looks like people are still struggling. Well, someone's taking up a dispute with the government's report card from the looks of it. Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob's 100-day report card score of 90% for his cabinet has been criticised by many people who did not believe that they deserve such a high score. This is as there are many issues that have not been resolved, such as the economy and economic well-being of the rakyat. Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, Abdul Latif Ahmad, has now clarified that the issue was not one of the key performance indicators. Kos sara hidup itu, dia melibatkan pelbagai uh, menteri merentas beberapa kementerian maka dia tidak masuk dalam 100 hari itu. Dan perlu dinyatakan dalam Dewan Yang Mulia ini bahawa 100 hari itu bukanlah titiknya. Itu koma saja. Ada banyak lagi perkara yang perlu dipenuhi oleh kementerian dan juga yang berhormat menteri. He said this in response to Rasa MP Chaki Chin, who had asked about the justification or method of evaluation used in the 100-day KPI. This was as 90% was already a high mark, but the people were still struggling with the rising cost of living, which has yet to be resolved by the government. Now, speaking of costs, it turns out that Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob's government has been spending the most to hire special advisors since Najib Abdul Razak's era, which, come to think of it, was not really that long ago since, you know, the last two years, felt like forever. Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaakob's government has hired a total of five special advisors at a cost of 136,136 ringgit a month. This is according to a parliamentary reply by Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, Abdul Latif Ahmad, who was asked for a list of all special advisors hired by the current and past governments. The current special advisors are Abdul Hadi Awal, Tiong King Singh, Richard Riot, as witness Warren and Azalina Osman said, the total cost per month is the highest since former Premier Najib Abdul Razak's era. Ismail Sabri's predecessor Moedin Yassin had four advisors who were paid a total of 99,886 ringgit a month. Ahmad Faisal Azumu was also appointed as special advisor for 22 days before Moedin's government collapsed. This would have brought the total cost to 127,113 ringgit. Meanwhile, Dr. Mahade Muhammad had a total of four advisors when he served as the Prime Minister of the Pakistan Harapan government. He paid a total of 46,853 ringgit a month to the advisors. 
After numerous back and forths with the government, Youth Party, the Malaysian United Democratic Alliance or MUDA, has won a court battle against the Home Ministry and they could just be registered very soon. The Kuala Lumpur High Court has ordered the Home Ministry to register the Malaysian United Democratic Alliance or MUDA as a political party within 14 days. The ministry was also ordered to pay 10,000 ringgit in costs. This was the decision from the legal challenge filed by the party against Home Minister Hamza Zainuddin's refusal of the group's appeal for registration as a political party. In a press conference after the decision today, MUDA Pro Tem President Said Sadiq Said Abdul Rahman expressed his gratitude to the judiciary. <laughs> kepada institusi kehakiman negara kerana kemenangan pada hari ini sejujurnya tidak berpihak kepada kami semata-mata tetapi kepada sistem demokrasi negara Today's court outcome is MUDA's third legal action to challenge Hamza's decision. Previously, MUDA had mounted an unsuccessful legal bid for registration. They then proceeded to appeal to the minister on the 4th of February. On the 12th of August, Hamza denied MUDA's appeal for registration. This led the group to withdraw their second legal action to compel the minister to make a decision over its appeal due to the alleged delay in decision-making. And now we have a message from our sponsor and when we're back we're going to court to get an update on former Premier Najib Abdul Razak's 1MDB case without Najib. Stay tuned. Shellfish, red meat and beer. If you love indulging in these foods, you may end up with high uric acid level in your blood. These foods consist high level of purine, a substance that will eventually break down into uric acid and be excreted through our urine. It is recommended that the amount of dietary purines should be kept between 600 to 1000 mg per day. Having too much uric acid in your blood can cause attacks of gout. It can also cause kidney stones and blockage in the kidney. The crystallization of the excessive uric acid in your blood can be eased by reducing purine-rich food to only 100 to 150 mg daily, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, and consuming urinary alkalinizer like Ural. It consists of sodium bicarbonate, citric acid, and sodium citrate that increases the urinary pH and solubility of uric acid to prevent crystallization. Best of all, it's lemon-flavored and sugar-free. Ural, effective urinary alkalinizer. Neutralize your uric acid problem now. Welcome back. The internet is really great. It got so many of us through the pandemic by allowing us to work from home. But it turns out that the internet can't replace everything, like former Prime Minister Najib Razak's presence in court. Just because most of us have turned to video calls to work from home doesn't mean everything is going to be on the internet. Former Prime Minister Najib Abdul Razak's Maisejatra status does not allow him to go to court for his own corruption trial, and that is extended to today. The prosecution proposed that a hybrid online trial be conducted, whereby the accused and his defense team could follow the hearing via Zoom from another location, while the judge and the prosecution can be on site at the High Court. Judge Colin Lawrence Sakera, however, has decided against it for now, meaning that the case will be heard in court. Sakera added that the court does not rule out the possibility of doing so in the future. Conducting case management and hearings online is not new, as many civil jurisdiction courts in Malaysia and abroad have turned to the internet to continue working as the COVID-19 pandemic hit. However, criminal courts still try for the most part to conduct trials in an open court. In this particular trial, Najib is facing four charges of abuse of power and 21 counts of money laundering involving 2.28 billion ringgit of 1MDB's funds. Who's to blame for the poor COVID-19 SOP enforcement at the Kluarga Malaysia 100-day event last week that made headlines for all the wrong reasons? Well, time to hear from the government about who has to face the music. Tak adillah nak tuduh kerajaan gagal kerana pihak-pihak tertentu tidak dapat memenuhi apa yang telah pun dijanjikan kepada kita. Tetapi apa jua keadaan yang salah tetap salah dan pihak penganjur uh, harus melihatnya sebagai pengajaran penganjur yang telah pun menganjur tetapi penganjur-penganjur yang akan datang bahawa um, kita tak membezakan sama ada daripada kerajaan daripada pihak swasta daripada NGO tapi akhirnya kalau salah tetap salah dan kita paksa berhadapan dengan apa yang telah pun dijatuhkan dari segi hukuman
This was a reply from Senior Defence Minister Hishamuddin Hussein on a question about the government not following their own standard operating procedures during the Kluarga Malaysia event. He was speaking at a press conference on the proposed amendment to the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act 1988 or Act 342. Hishamuddin added that whenever people request permission to organize events like this, they would promise to abide by all SOPs and regulations, but they often end up failing in terms of monitoring and enforcement. He also commented on the low fine to those who violated the SOPs. Hishamuddin said the maximum fine of 1,000 ringgit was not sufficient to act as a deterrent, especially for companies that may be earning billions, and this was the reason the government wanted to amend the act. The four-day event held at the Kuala Lumpur Convention Centre last week was packed with those mostly ignoring physical distancing measures meant to curb the spread of COVID-19. The organiser of the event, the Shared Prosperity Delivery Unit, has since defended its crowd control efforts by saying that it outlined a strict set of SOPs, but individual compliance has been a challenge faced by every event organiser. With 2022 fast approaching and the 15th general election just on the horizon, it still isn't clear on whether Barisan National and Perikata National will continue to work together or not. AMNO has not made any decision to defend the Perikata National Government in the next general election. This is according to AMNO Supreme Council member Armand Ashar Abu Hanifa. When contacted by Malaysia Kini, he said that the party is more interested in resolving issues related to people's welfare and economy. He said they also upheld the decree of the Yang Di Pertuan Agong to ensure that the agenda of the country and the people would be prioritized. He added that as an AMNO leader, he will definitely follow the party's official decision when this matter is discussed in the future. Previously, AMNO President Ahmad Zaid Hamidi claimed that the party had decided in its 2020 General Assembly and Supreme Council not to cooperate with Bersatu in the next general election. AMNO is currently part of the federal government led by its vice president Ismail Sabri Yaakob. The government is formed with a combination of several major political coalitions and parties, including Barisa National and Perikata National, which includes Bersatu. Now we have a branded capsule about the Seratus Hari Aspirasi Keluarga Malaysia. More than 100,000 visitors were recorded for the 100 days of Aspirasi Kraga Malaysia, which ended on Sunday. This good response is an increase of about 400% compared to the original expectation, which only estimated the attendance of a total of 20,000 visitors within four days of the program. Chief Secretary to the government, Tan Sri Mohamad Zuki Ali, said several amendments to certain matters had been made due to the unexpected response. Among them, the closure of Royal Malaysian Police PDRM and Road Transport Department JPJ summons discount counters to avoid so many attendees that are unable to adhere and compliance with Standard Operating Procedures SOP set by the National Security Council. We also found that on the fourth day, although the visitors were not as many on the first day, SOP compliance was strict and orderly. A total of 31 booths comprising 26 ministries and five agencies under the Prime Minister's department are available. Some visitors, when interviewed, said such programs should be organised again every year and extended to other states for those who do not have the opportunity to attend KLCC this year. The organisation of events like this also illustrates that the country's economy situation has improved as people have started to going out to spend and obtain available services. Well then, that's a wrap for Kini News this evening. For more stories, go to kinitv.com. Don't forget you can follow us on our social media on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube and Facebook in order to get the latest news headlines. If you would like to support the independent media, please do consider a subscription to malaysiakini.com. When you're heading out, please don't forget your mask. It's going to get very expensive very soon if you do. And when you can, please try to stay home. I'm Daniel Anthony. Thank you for watching. And as always, stay safe, Malaysia. Everyone wants to see these scenes bigger. That's why we've got bigger TVs for everyone to enjoy them bigger. Watch colors come to life on a large screen. LG Nanocell.